Welcome back to Ats TV. Cam Luke here, joined by superstar dishes throw Danny Stevens and Matt Lynch as well. And before Christmas, we did of course see the Zatapec 10,000, which doubles as the 10,000 metre national championship. And we are joined by the back-to-back -back winner, first in nearly 30 years. Can you tell me, Stuart McSwain, as I bring you in? Welcome. Firstly, congratulations. Can you tell me the last back-to-back -back male winner? Yeah, I, I heard a rumour um, after Zatapec that the last Australian to do it was Steve Monaghetti in the early 90s. So it just shows how hard it is and how competitive the event is to be able to try, try and go back to back. So, yeah, I kind of got pretty lucky on the night, which is obviously pretty good. It got a little bit cold too late for us fans sitting in the stands, but it was a wonderful night. We might start with the, uh, the women's side of it first because really in the end, Hatumi Nia was outstanding. She took off from the gun almost, and I think everyone in the stands, Danny and Matt, were sitting there waiting for her to come back a little bit to Sinead Diver, who was the first Australian cross the line, but it just never happened. No, it's a, it's a bit of a tactic you see from a lot of the Japanese athletes. They really just go to the front, and, and if you can't pull that gap back, they'll just keep going further and further ahead. And as you can see here, just kept that cadence going all the way to the line, and... It really did help Sinead as well, chasing early and showed with the time that she ran. Yeah, just missed the World Championship A qualifier for, by a second Sinead dive, but she was outstanding. When you're watching this, Stu, and you're watching it and you're about to compete with the, the men's being after, as we see Sinead cross the line desperately trying to chase that, that A qualifier there. Do you watch much of the, the women's race or are you too busy focused in the zone for what you need to do? Yeah, I think I was halfway through my warm-up when they were finishing, so I snuck in before I went to call room and had a look. It's kind of, it was pretty impressive seeing those girls run so fast because it's kind of a stigma that you can't run that fast in Australia. So kind of gave me no excuse to try and run, try and run that qualifier um, after seeing the girls get so close. Uh, the Japanese girl went under and Sinead so close. So it's a bit of motivation before the men's race. Sinead Diver had a wonderful 2018 uh, PBs all through the year and, and obviously that Melbourne Marathon win, which was so great. You were there pacing her. What, what's it like? And you're, you're a competitive athlete and you're trying to win gold whenever you jump on the track, but a little bit different as a pacer. How, how do you handle it? How, how is it for you? And, and how much enjoyment do you take when she achieved a goal or she did? Yeah, definitely. She's had a pretty impressive um, 2018 season. I think, yeah, she's 41 years old. It's pretty pretty amazing, really. Um, she did mention it's not to mention her age, but there you go, Stuart. <laughs> I'm glad you did it, not us. <laughs> but, um, yeah, being able to pace at Melbourne was pretty special just because she's in my training group. I train with her a lot. Um, she had big goals going in, and to, yeah, see her be able to do it on the day was, yeah, a pretty special moment. When I was there at the finish watching her cross the line, you could tell it was a pretty big career highlight for her. So, yeah, it was pretty good to see. Um, yeah, fantastic effort, Stuart. Um, a 15 second personal best um, in that race. Um, so how does your training at altitude with your Melbourne Track Club set you up for that? As a novice long distance runner, I don't know much about it. So how does Falls Creek set you up? Because a lot of the athletes seem to come down and have really great performances off the back of those camps. Yeah, I think we're lucky in Australia. We've got Falls Creek, which is um, about 1,600 metres. Um, it obviously makes training a little bit harder. We normally go there for about three to four weeks. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's just that environment. You're stepping out of the city. You don't have the distractions. You can just focus solely on training. And I think that's the reason we run so well off it, just because you're 100% a full-time athlete that month, you're up at altitude. So I think that's, yeah, that's why we get good results coming down off the altitude. Now you had, uh, we were talking before, you helped Sinead get through that marathon, but you yourself had some help uh, at Zatapec, Ryan Gregson and Geordie Williams pushing you through the first few Ks. Was that a PB even for Geordie going through 5K? Yeah, I think it was about a 15 second PB for Geordie, timing me through halfway. But yeah, I think it's credit to the, the team we've got at the Melbourne Track Club when you've got probably the two best 1500 guys in Australia putting their hand up to pace a 10K to help out a few teammates to try and get the qualifier. So yeah, I was pretty privileged to have guys like that in my squad that were willing to sacrifice um, a bit of training to be able to put in and try and help me get that time as I did at Zatapec. Obviously, Danny spoke about the altitude and you've got you know, great coach and nutrition, so you looked after really well, but you got swagger coach because we did see a little bit of vision there of you rolling down the straight, the one finger in the air, you've now got the full arm sleeves that have become the norm in professional sport. Is that just natural attitude that you have that we all love or is that someone that's been able to instill in you? Yeah, I don't know. I kind of just... Um yeah, I watch a bit of NBA and probably there it is. A, bit, a little bit from that. But I'm just like, when people ask me about it, if I celebrate too much at the end of races, I say you never know when your last, your next win's going to be. So you got to enjoy the moment. You train so many months at high intensity for that little, that maybe minute around the final lap to celebrate. Mm. So yeah, I don't have a problem if people. Are, um, <laughs> you're going to. Oh, we love it. There's no problem yeah. from where we sit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I know Danny was going to ask a question about what events you're going to really have a crack at this yeah, year. Yeah, what's your plan for the domestic season? And, um, yeah, what is your focus for the Doha World Championships? Yeah, so I'll compete in the 5,000 metre national um, championships, which are in the Sydney Track Classic this year. So that will be good, add a little bit to that event. Um, and then I'll do the 1,500 and the national champs as well. So 
they'll be my focus in the domestic season and then Europe will be about getting the times and trying to um, hopefully qualify for the 5k and the 1500 for Doha but I don't have any times yet so I've just got to focus on trying to do well at the qualifying races and then yeah run fast in Europe and hopefully that takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. Is the schedule for Doha quite friendly to do those two events? Yeah, so surprisingly it's one of the years where it does work well because the 5K is probably my strongest, so that's early on the schedule. Um, and then I'll just be able to have a crack at the 1500 because I haven't competed internationally in that event yet. So th that's kind of a sum I'm excited about trying. Um, but yeah, the 5K will be the, the definitely the main event I'll focus on. Yeah. So you're going to do any specific training to get used to like, acclimatise for the Doha conditions as well because it's going to be quite tough, high 30s, low 40s kind of conditions. Yeah, definitely. I think we, we had a base camp in Spain last year, um, which is obviously Spain in the middle of the year is probably 30 degrees most days. So I think that's probably where we'll base again. And yeah, that will give us a good, um, good stepping stone leading into Doha just because we'll get used to that hot weather, um, racing in the hot climates. I think I'll do a couple of Diamond Leagues like Rabat in Morocco in preparation. So it's going to be that humid, hot conditions. I think that will help us make sure we're ready to go at 100% when Doha comes around. Yep. Well, you mentioned Rabat. That's where you uh, did your PB for the 3,000 metres. Pretty much every time you stepped on the track in Europe, you were dropping PBs. Have you got a, a time target for something, something that you really want? So maybe that you know, sub-13 for the 5K this season? Uh, yeah, definitely. Times are nice. Um, you're going into races hoping to run a PB, but most of the time you just focus on competing. Um, but, yeah, I would love to go sub-13. That's probably the big milestone I'd love to break this year. But there's only one race where people went under 13 this year, which was Brussels, so it's obviously pretty hard to do. But you were in that race. Yeah, though. exactly. <laughs> so I'm hopeful I can do it. I know I'm definitely a lot fitter this time of year than I was last year, so I'm hoping if I can keep it going, there's no reason I can't take it to a new level this year. So, yeah, it's um, pretty exciting times. Looking forward to it. Back-to-back mm -hmm. -back, Zatopek winner, Stuart McSwain. First time since 91, 92 when it was done by Steve Monaghetti, who went on, obviously, to have such an illustrious career. Hang around. We're going to talk some cross-country with Stuart McSwain next.